We're in chapter 10 of John's Gospel, and we're going to look at verses 30 to 42. We're going to wind up this wonderful chapter this morning. John 10, verses 30 to 42. Verse 30 says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Because thou being a man, makest thyself God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, your God? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture came, uh, cannot be broken, say ye of him, whom the Father has sanctified, and sent into the world, Thou blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye have believed not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hands. And went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And then he resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And then he believed on him there. Well, let's pray. We'll pray silently for just a moment, as is our custom, as we attempt to get our hearts ready for the preaching of the word. Father, as always, we come before you as your children to ask to be taught your word this morning. Uh, we can't understand it. It will not bless us. It will not encourage us unless you, through your Holy Spirit, make it come alive. And so we ask you to do that for us this morning so that we might rejoice in your word, rejoice in you, and rejoice in your son. Your word is all about your son. Help us now as we preach in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, John chapter 10 ends in a very dramatic scene. A man stands in the temple court surrounded by an angry mob. Each one has a stone in his hand and he's ready to throw it. It's a scene right out of the Old Testament which ordered stoning as the penalty for certain heinous crimes. It's not surprising that this crowd was led by religious leaders. But what is surprising is the identity of the man whom they're about to kill by stoning. We might expect a, a criminal or some kind of troublemaker to be in such a situation, but this man is famous for his marvelous good works. We might imagine a person in this situation panicking cowering back, trying to run away. But this man does none of these things. He was apparently unfazed by the threat, and so he spoke calm words that both challenged and rebuked. He said in verse 32, Many good works have I showed thee from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? And so John's long account of Jesus' conflict with the Jewish leaders ends with this. He had performed marvelous works of mercy and love in their presence, but they hated him for the truth that he revealed. This was continued throughout history. Whether it was the Roman Emperor Nero, his sadistic torture of the early Christians, or the ruthless persecution of Christians by the communist regimes in the 20th century, or today's postmodern intolerance. For anything Christian, Jesus still stands and he asks, many good works have I showed you from my Father, 
For which of these works do you stone me? The accusers had an answer for Jesus' question. They had no problems with his good works, they said, although the record shows that they often did. But here it was Jesus' words that had enraged them. We read in verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And this is in reference to Jesus' statement in verse 30, where he unequivocally said, I and my Father are one. This uh, is as plain and direct a statement that Jesus ever made that he was God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And his hearers were outraged. It was obvious that Jesus was a man just like them, and yet he made himself out to be God. It was blasphemy in their opinion, pure and simple. Now what did Jesus mean by saying, I and my Father are one? Let's examine that. First, Jesus declared a unity of will between God, the Father, and himself. In the preceding verse, you'll recall from last week, Jesus had declared the security of all those who believe in him. Verse 28 said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then to further add to the security, he added, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So it's with this in mind that he went on to say, I and my father are one. They're in my hand, they're in his hand, they're in God's hand. We're one, and no one's going to pluck them out of our hand. Jesus is united with the will of the father to secure the sheep, the sheep that the Father had given to the Son before the foundation of the world. Now there's a second way in which we should take Jesus' statement of unity with the Father. They're not just united in will, but also they're united in works. Jesus does the will of God. He is the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, verse 37 says. Now back in John chapter 5 and verse 36, Jesus spoke of the works which the Father hath given me to finish. And later on in chapter 14 and verse 10, 10, he will say, But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So, putting this together, Jesus is one with God in his will as well as his works. And therefore, whenever we see, see Jesus doing something, we can be sure that God the Father is acting in and through him. And this was especially true of his primary work of dying on the cross. Now, a lot of the commentators stop at this point, seeing this passage only a unity of will and work between Jesus and God the Father. But I think it's very clear from what follows that there is more. Jesus sets forth a unity of essence with the Father. I and the Father are one, he insists in verse 30. And then he elaborates in verse 38, the Father is in me and I in him. Now, Jesus is not referring simply to the way in which God indwells believers like us, to the Holy Spirit. Rather, he means that he and the Father are one divine being. Now, in theological terms, this is the same as saying that the Son is of the exact same substance as the Father, and they are equal in power, and they are equal in glory. And so this brings us to the mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity. This doctrine states that there is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
And by one God, we mean that there are not three different gods, but one God. Yet there are three divine persons who share this one divine being. So in this respect, it's notable that Jesus did not use the masculine gender when he said, he and the Father are one. Had he done so, he would have indicated that he and the Father were one person. And this is obviously not true, since Jesus prays to the Father, and he does the Father's will. They are distinct persons, and because of that, Jesus uses the neuter gender for one, referring not to his person, but to his substance. Jesus and the Father are one being. Now, whether you understand that or not, his hearers did. They clearly understood what Jesus was saying. Had Jesus meant only that his will was aligned with God or that his work was the work of God's, the Jews may have disagreed with that, but they wouldn't have thought that he deserved to be stoned for blasphemy. They understood clearly what he meant. And here's what he meant to them. Thou, being a man, makest thyself God. It would be like Chaz standing up in his Sunday school class and announcing to you, I'm God. And we would say, no, you're not. You're Chaz. You're a man like everyone else. That's how they thought that. Thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And according to our Old Testament rules and regulations, you deserve to be stoned. Now, Jesus didn't correct this, uh, this understanding, even though in doing so, he would have removed this threat to his life. He didn't step back, no, 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 no. I'm not saying I'm God. I'm just saying I'm doing his will, just like you people try to do his will. He didn't defend himself that way. Those who say that Jesus never claimed to be personally God have to reckon with this counter encounter. Here, Jesus defends himself from the charge of blasphemy, not by denying that he is God, but setting forth that he actually is. Yeah, you understood right. I and the Father are one. In looking at this, there are at least four important implications of Jesus' claim to be God and to be one with God. And the first is that we have knowledge of God in him since Jesus is God. He's going to say later on in John 14, 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And so whatever we're seeing in Jesus, we see the Father. His statement is not just a, a revelation by words. Plenty of men have talked about God and have said true and wonderful things about him. It's one thing to talk about God in words, but it's another thing to show us God in deeds and in life. The one is the work of man, the other is the work of God in the flesh. And this being the case, if we want to know God, we can see him revealed in the person and the work of Jesus as recorded in the Bible. What's God like? He's like Jesus. Because he is Jesus. We see God in Jesus. That's the first implication when he says, I and my Father are one. Second, since Jesus is God, believers can be sure that our sins are forgiven through the death on the cross. Some people object to the Christian doctrine of the atonement, arguing that, that no man can die for another man's sins. And this is true, except that Jesus wasn't just a mere man. He was the eternal Son of God, whose shed blood is of infinite value in paying the penalty for our sins. The third implication, if Jesus is God, then we can completely rely on his promises. If he is one with the Father, then he is certain to fulfill all that he has pledged to do. 
I might make a promise, and I've probably done this with my children. Dad, yeah, can we do this? Yeah, we can do that. You promise? Yeah, I promise. And then something comes up, and I have to break my promise. I don't want to, but I can't help but break my promise because I'm a mere man, and I'm not in control of circumstances. The circumstances cause me as a man to have to break my promise. But since Jesus is God, everything he promises, he will be kept. He won't break a promise because he is God. He is in control of all the circumstances. There's not one thing that can happen that can cause him to break his promise. And so when he promises eternal life, we can count on that. When he promises that no one's going to pluck us out of the Father's hand or his hand, we can count on that promise. Nothing's going to ever happen to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I give them eternal life, he says, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's a promise he's going to keep. Now, realizing these things will change the way we look at life and especially death. D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist, the famous preacher, he tells of a young woman many years ago who was being overcome by an infection. And those were the days when medical care was poor. They didn't have the antibiotics and the IV stuff that we have today. And so this infection was causing her condition to rapidly deteriorate. She had gone blind and she seemed to be in a coma. And the doctor stood beside her and sadly said to her parents, poor thing. I'm afraid she's seen her best days. But the girl was not asleep. When she heard what the doctor said, she spoke. You're wrong, doctor. My best days are not behind me, but before me, I will see the king in his glory. Now, how could this young Christian, her days cut short, and the best part of her earthly life, speak with such confidence? Because she knew God, having seen him in the face of Jesus Christ, because she knew that the blood of Christ had given her complete forgiveness of all of her sins, and because knowing Jesus to be God, she could completely rely on his promise of eternal life. She looked at death that way, as we should. Uh, a fourth implication of Jesus' teaching that he and the Father are one deserves, I think, special attention. Jesus' claim to be one with God establishes his authority. His words have authority as the very word of God. His teaching has authority to rule our lives. Jesus has the right to demand our faith. He has the right to demand our obedience and his sovereign will can never be thwarted. This is why the Jews didn't stone him, just as they hadn't been able to arrest him earlier because they couldn't, they couldn't end his life with this encounter because it wasn't time yet. I and the Father are one, Jesus says. This means that he commands our obedience and we refuse him at the peril of our own souls. He has authority. Listen to what he says. Those red letter verses in the Bible, read them and listen to what he says. He is God speaking there. It was because of his claim to be God that the unbelieving Jews had taken up stones to throw at Jesus. And Jesus challenged their judgment, asking, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which one of these works do you stone me? Now, as we think about that verse, it establishes a very sound principle. We should not judge a person's claim until we see what he or she can do. A person might claim to be a great artist or a great athlete or a, a, a great leader. We had a, a man who attended our church. I, I hope he's in heaven now. I'm not sure of his soul and the condition of his soul. His name was Robert Stevens, and he purported to be a great artist. 
but we never saw any of his paintings. He says, I, I, you know, I, I sell my paintings and this and that and the other thing, but he would come to church and we ne he never brought a painting to church. And we all kind of doubted some of the things he said until one time we went out to the Kennedy Space Center and lo and behold, there was a painting by Robert A.M. Stevens. Well, now we believed him because, yeah, he is a great painter. And it was a beautiful thing, beautiful enough to be in the Smithsonian and beautiful enough to be displayed at the Kennedy Space Center. So we shouldn't judge a person's claims until we see what he or she can do. I'm a great athlete. Well, what do you do? Do you run fast? Can you shoot a basketball? What makes you a great athlete? I'm a great leader. Well, prove that by your leadership. But we shouldn't reject their claim until we examine their achievements. Uh, Jesus had made a great claim. Was there evidence? Were, there, were, were words backed up by works? John's gospel has already answered that question abundantly. Jesus healed the sick. He cast out demons. He cured lepers. He fed the hungry. He gave sight to the blind. In the next chapter, he's even going to raise the dead to life. Spoiler alert. <laughs> when Jesus speaks of his good works, we might take this to be the whole pattern of his life. His life was defined by doing good. But here he is probably referring specifically to his miracles. What do these miracles say about Jesus? Do Jesus' mighty works lead us to conclude that he was blaspheming when he identified himself with God? Or do they rather lead us to the opposite conclusion that one who performed these divine works must be from God and must act in the power of God? What Jesus has done was simply beyond the power of any man. Should they therefore stone him or carefully consider the fact that he just might be God? And this makes an important point regarding unbelief. There's never enough evidence for one who is determined not to believe. Jesus was not threatening the well-being of people but only the self-centered agenda of these unbelievers. He went about doing good, Acts 19.38 said. He lived a life of love. His character confirmed his identity to such an extent that he could challenge those who knew him to convict him of even a single sin, and they couldn't do it. In addition, Jesus performed wonderful miracles that no mere man could conceivably do, but his opponents still did not accept him because they were determined not to surrender their own agendas. If he's right, then we're wrong, and we're going to have to step down. And they didn't want to give it up. J.C. Ryle quoted an older author who put it well, Unconverted men would kill God himself if they could only get at him. Jesus' opponents, they could not refute his good works. But, they insisted, they were stoning him, not because of what he did, but because of what he said. Verse 33 again, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Here we have an instance of the Apostle John's irony because his believing readers know that the exact opposite is really true. Jesus, being God, had made himself man. And Jesus refuted the charge of blasphemy in a way that's kind of hard for us to follow today. I'll try to make it as clear as I can. He, he knew that his accusers wanted a legal pretext for murdering him and following the standard rabbinical approach uh, to, to debating Jesus took this pretext away from them and here's how he did it Jesus answered them is it not written in your law 
I said, you're gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, the Jews were basing their accusation on the scriptures. So Jesus exposed their inability to handle the scriptures correctly. And he was quoting Psalm 82 and verse 6. This is what Paul read this morning. It is a psalm of rebuke to the unjust judges of Israel. And the full verse reads, I have said, ye are gods, little g, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now, some people, uh, such as the Mormons, use Jesus' quotation in this verse to argue that all believers will ultimately become gods. But this is just a preposterous interpretation. Rather, the psalm acknowledges that the judges of ancient Israel ruled with God's authority. They were as gods among the people, fulfilling the holy task on God's behalf. Maybe the easiest way for me to explain this is we have a Supreme Court and they are really the gods of our nation. They determine what's right and what's wrong. They determine some 40 years ago that people have a right to kill their babies. And now, praise God, they're probably going to overturn that, overturn that. and if they do, they're acting as messengers of God doing the right thing. And so we might refer to them as God's little g in the fact of what Psalm 86 and verse 2 says, that I have said, you're gods. But they were gods among the people, fulfilling God's task. The point of this psalm, though, is not to exalt these human rulers as gods, but to threaten them for their unjust ways. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes, because you're unjust judges, acting as gods and not doing what the true God wants. So what did Jesus accomplish by quoting this verse? His point was not to prove his own deity. He used his works for that but rather to show that his accusers lack a biblical basis for their charge of blasphemy. You think you know your Bible, but you don't. You don't. The Bible itself uses the word God for certain mortal men, although only in a highly qualified sense, they were judges. And therefore, it was not absolutely blasphemous for Jesus to do the same with reference to himself. In fact, if sinful judges in the past could be referred to as gods, how much more ought Jesus, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, verse 36, be considered worthy of such a title? In addition, I think it's likely that Jesus had a double purpose for quoting Psalm 82. The psalm condemns unjust rulers who set themselves up as gods, which is exactly what Jesus' opponents were doing on that very day. In passing, we should note the high claim that Jesus makes about the scriptures. He refers to the Old Testament as the word of God in verse 35, and he says that the scripture cannot be broken. That means it cannot be refuted, it cannot be set aside. And he bases his entire defense on one word in a single psalm, that little word God's. And this affirms the authority of every single word in the Bible as being inspired from God himself. And it's not going to pass away. A lot of the new versions cut out some of the words that are inspired by God. Some men have decided, well, it'll be a better, clearly understood. We can read this better if we leave this part out. No, you don't leave any part out. Not one word, because it's all inspired and it can't be set aside. 
I want you to notice the severity with which Jesus treats these false accusers. While Jesus treated the simple, erring sinners with mercy and kindness, he was severe in condemning these false teachers. James chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And following his example, we should be gentle with those who are led astray, but we must sharply confront the false teachers who are leading them astray. And by the way, I've never been afraid to do that. It's part of my job. And a lot of people don't like that part of their job, and they think it's unloving, but it's the most loving thing we can do. Jesus concludes by saying that if they really understood the scriptures, his accusers would believe in him. Verses 37 and 38. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. In other words, since Jesus performed works that could only come from God, the Jews should think very seriously about his claim to be God. Think about this if you're not a believer in Jesus. Who else could turn water into wine? Who else could raise the sick and the lame by a simple word? Who could feed a vast multitude with just a few fish and loaves of bread? Who could give sight to a man born blind? There are miracles recorded in the Gospel of John. Let's face the facts that force you to believe. The gospel proclaims that Jesus as the true Son of God and the world's only Savior. Should you not give thought to this if you are an unbeliever? Does not this warrant you to open your mind and study this gospel for yourself and open up the Bible for yourself? Jesus says that by this kind of honest investigation, you will get understanding. In fact, by the power of his word, Jesus offers to open blind eyes to see him as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus' works were not yet finished. In the next chapter, he performs his greatest miracle, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, an event attested to by numerous eyewitnesses. Think about what king or what person, what man could ever do this? But Jesus' greatest work was performed on the cross where he died to pay the penalty of all the sins of all the people who will believe in him. Matthew's gospel records that when Jesus died, the earth shook, rocks were split, and a great darkness fell on the earth. And a Roman centurion standing by thought about all of these things, and he was led to say, truly, this was the Son of God. Everyone should say that. Everyone should say that. Now, this passage, I think, contains at least three or four important applications for we believers. The first is a calling to truth. The problem with the Pharisees and other religious leaders was that they really didn't know the Bible. They talked about the Bible. They memorized the Bible. I told you in the past, if you're a Pharisee, you had to have the first five books of the Bible committed to memory to join the club. They made a show of their supposed loyalty to the scriptures, but they really didn't know what the Bible taught. They had been using it to support their own preconceived notions. And therefore, even though the great message of the Bible is the coming of God's Son as Savior and Lord, they justified their unbelief by appealing to the Scriptures. Now, I emphasize this because so many professing Christians today in the United States of America do not know their Bibles. They don't, folks. They own Bibles. 
They carry them, or at least they have them on their phones, but they do not earnestly study their Bible. They do not know the biblical reasons for what they believe, and many of them believe things that are false. I listened to a podcast a couple of weeks ago where a survey was done, and 82% of Americans in general believe that the Bible contains the words, cleanliness is next to godliness. Or, God helps those who help themselves. They think that's a Bible verse. 82% of Americans believe that. 81% of professing Christians believe that. So we're 1% better than the world in our understanding of the scriptures. 43% of professing Christians believe Sodom and Gomorrah were married. And they go to church every Sunday and they sing their goofy songs and a preacher comes up with some kind of serious message and he finds a few verses to back what he's trying to say. They don't know their Bibles. And the fact is that many of them today would not tolerate sound biblical teaching. How many preachers that they stood up and preached the sovereignty of God and salvation, the doctrine of election and predestination, the doctrine of particular redemption, if they stood up and preached that, how many of them will be that pastor next week? They'd fire him. They'd say, blasphemy, we want to stone you. Because they don't know their Bibles. Some value the Bible only for the practical help that it gives without any real interest in the truths of God and man and salvation. Folks, the Bible is not made relevant by its usefulness to our worldly lifestyles. Rather, the Bible is relevant in and of itself being the very word of God. And unless Christians are people of truth, we will not stand in this current world our errors will contribute to the loss of many souls, including some of our own. That verse in Matthew chapter 7, or chapter 21, no, chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do great things? Oh, I taught Sunday school. I played in the praise band. I came to worship you every Sunday. I bounced around and I raised my hands. I believed your Bible. At least I said I did. I did great things in your name. No, I never knew you. I never knew you. Churches are filled with people that will hear that this day. They don't stand for truth. They won't believe the truth. A second application is that Christians are called to a life of holiness and love. We see this in the relationship between Jesus' word and his works. It's fair for people to judge the truth that we profess by the life we lead. Jesus challenged his accusers to do this. Could you? Does your life show evidence of the spirit of Christ in you? If our answer as Christians is no, if there is little of Jesus to be seen in us, then our words are not likely to have much impact in this world. They're not going to listen to what we say. Third, Christians are called to give a verbal witness to Christ and his gospel. And we know the truth of this because we have to know the truth, we have to live the truth, and we have to tell the truth. And we see the last of these in the final verses of these chapters. This chapter, verses 40 through 42. And Jesus left and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized. And there he abode. And so he's leaving Jerusalem, going across the Jordan where John used to be. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. Now, this is encouraging, or at least it should be, because what came before was so disheartening. We wonder, will anyone believe the gospel? 
If Jesus showed himself in the temple with such powerful words and works and still was rejected, what hope is there for the gospel in such a world? Jesus was rejected at the temple because the people were proud and hard-hearted. So he went out back into the country, back to the place where John the Baptist had preached, and many believed on him there. And that should really encourage our witness. Notice it says that John the Baptist was not able to do any miracles. All he could do was to lead a holy life and tell people about Jesus. And that's exactly what we're called to do. I can't perform any miracles, folks. I don't have that ability. I can't lay my hands on people's heads and say, be thou healed or come out of your deaf ears and all this stuff that the faith healers purport to do. I can't do that and neither can you. But we can tell people about Jesus and that's what John the Baptist did. We can lead a holy life and tell people to Jesus. So it isn't necessary for a pastor or Christian workers to perform wonders. We don't have to walk on water. We don't have to turn water into wine. We just tell people about Jesus and as John did, warn them about the judgment to come for their sin. It's significant that this was the place where people had been brought under conviction of sin. So Jesus went there with his gospel. All John did was to show people their need and direct them toward Jesus as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Having heard about Jesus, these people went to see him for themselves. And when they met him, they said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And this is why we have to tell the world about Jesus and add to it, the witness with our lives so that people will see him and experience him for themselves. And when their hearts have been prepared by the awareness of their own need for the forgiveness of sin, he offers forgiveness to any and all who will believe on him. John had come and gone, but knowing the truth, living the truth, and telling the truth, his life was still making a difference. And the same will be true of you and I. The people can say of us, I remember what they said about Jesus, and when I met him, everything they said about him was true. And so we give them the gospel, just like John the Baptist with fire and authority. We pull out the law of God and we say, you have lied, you have stolen, you have committed adultery in your mind and in your heart, if not physically, you have coveted. And every one of those sins is punishable by death from a holy God. And you will perish in the hellfire forever and ever and ever because of their sins and because you are a sinner and you are hopeless. There's not a thing you can do about it. And then we say, but here's Jesus. <laughs> here's Jesus. He can forgive you. He can pay the penalty for your sin. You can flee the wrath to come by turning to him, by believing him. He is God. And he came to seek and to save sinners just like you. And he paid for the sinner's penalty on the, uh, on the cross. Sinners just like you believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gospel. We thank you that Jesus is God, that he came to save us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us the faith and repentance that allowed us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And we pray that you might use the talking that we've done about Jesus this morning We've tried to hold him up. We've tried to lift him up. And we pray that people will look and, to live and live. And for those of us who have, we pray that our hearts might be lifted in praise and adoration for the one who forgave us, the one who died for us, the one who is our shepherd, who leads us and protects us. May we worship him in spirit 
and in truth this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.